big, big picture story and uh, to put all of the Old Testament kind of into context. And that's really what I like about what the Bible Project does. It takes these Bible themes and it kind of puts them in the big picture. They have stories you can actually read just individual books and they kind of do the same thing to tell you about individual books and then there's theme, other kinds of themes and that sort of thing. But for today, just for the next couple of minutes, I just want to kind of put what we're going to do over the course of the summer into context. And I think that really does a good job of it, um, but I'm going to add a few thoughts to it and, uh, and we'll go from there. So, so we've got this law, as you've heard, uh, we've got this law, and uh, it was given to the people of Israel, and now it's fulfilled, right? So what do we do with the Old Testament? What do we do with the Ten Commandments? How do we relate to them? Are they still relevant for today? And um, let's look at a couple of scriptures. I'm just going to highlight these for you. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says this, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. One of the cornerstone scriptures that we rely on as Protestants, as evangelicals, to, to talk about the fact that our faith in God is rooted in God's grace towards us and our response to him through faith. Of course, Matthew twenty two thirty seven 37 to 39, and I'm just paraphrasing it here. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. That was Jesus talking. So Jesus and Paul. Let's go on. Paul continues in Galatians 5, 4. He says this, For if you are trying to make yourselves right with God by keeping the law, well, you've been cut off from Christ because you have fallen away from God's grace. That's a pretty strong statement to the Galatians who were trying to fulfill some of what was written in the Old Testament, but Paul was trying to encourage them and say, no, there's something new that we're looking at here. In Galatians 5.18, later in that chapter, he says, But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. The law that we just saw in picture form, right? That law of Moses, the Ten Commandments, and the 613, that selection uh, of laws that are known largely as the Torah. So we're not under obligation to the law of Moses. And it goes on later, he says, Share each other's burdens, and in this way you obey the law of Christ. And so there's this idea now that there's something new. The New Testament ushered in something new about our relationship to this Old Testament law. And part of the challenge that we have is that if we set it up in our minds as sort of this dichotomy, it's one or the other, we kind of lose the benefit of looking at the story. And we lose the benefit of understanding what God was trying to show us through the Old Testament. So we have to be careful in our minds not to set it up as this dichotomy. It's one or the other. Yes, it's only Christ. And I want to I make sure that we are clear here this morning. The law, what we just looked at in the Old Testament, these Ten Commandments, they cannot save you. And the story of the Israelites proved that, right? Every time God created these laws, they just proceeded to break them. Now, if that was you and I, we would do the same thing. I'm sorry to say that to all of you, but if we were them, we would do the same thing because it's the disposition of the human heart. Since the fall of creation, since Eve in Adam ate the apple and, and ate the fruit, whatever it is you want to call it, right? The, the disposition of the human heart is towards sin and towards rebellion. So we would do the same thing. The law cannot save you. It is only by grace. It is only by faith. And you could read further in Hebrews eleven six. Without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So we know it's grace, we know it's faith, faith is required, and at Romans 10, 17, how does our faith grow? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing about the good news of Jesus Christ. So how does our faith grow? We grow by gathering together. Why do we meet like this? Sometimes we, we ask the question, why do I need to come to church? Why do I need to meet in these small groups? Why do I need to rub shoulders with other people? Well, it's because in these groups, 
we hear from each other and we encourage one another with our words and with the reading of Scripture and through prayer, we encourage one another and that grows our faith. That grows our understanding of who God is and it's in that, that's part of his grace towards us. That's how we grow in our understanding of who he is. So, the law cannot save us. By God's grace only, through salvation, we give, our sa- we give ourselves to Christ. You read a little bit in Romans, uh, if you got to those verses, Romans 7, 1 through 13, this image of the marriage. Kind of like the Israelites in the Old Testament, they were married to the law. But in the New Testament, when we give ourselves through salvation, we give ourselves to Christ, and in baptism, we go down under the water symbolically, we become dead. We become dead to all that was. That's the symbolism of baptism. When we come up, we are a new creation. We are no longer married to all that other stuff. And it's in that death to our old self that we become free to give ourselves to Christ. And so it's in that freedom. That's the image Paul is using in Romans chapter 7. It's a wonderful image, and it's the image of marriage, and people could relate to that, right? If I'm married to Julia and I die, then Julia is no longer bound to me. She is free to remarry somebody else. And so that's the idea behind the law. I died to the law, now I am free to give myself to Christ. That's the good news of the New Testament. And that's what Jesus Christ was representing. But I also want to highlight, if you read it together, Romans 7 verse 12. The law in and of itself is not bad. In fact, Paul uses some examples to even talk about the idea of coveting. How would I even have known that coveting was wrong if it wasn't for the law? He says in 7.12, but still, the law itself is holy, and its commandments are holy and right and good. So it's not the law, it's our disposition, it's our response, it's our sinfulness. And so, when we're looking at the law, when we're looking at the Old Testament, we're looking at the story, we don't want to just cast it aside and say, well, it doesn't really apply to us. It doesn't, it's no longer relevant, right? It's still holy in and of itself. It was given by God to his people. Now, Jesus Christ, yes, he fulfilled that. We cannot follow the law well enough, good enough, to be saved. But it doesn't mean that the law no longer applies, course, Jesus Christ came along and he said, what are the two greatest commandments? Well, the greatest commandments are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. We have it on our wall. It's right there. Love God and love others. That's really the story of the New Testament, to love God and to love others. You heard it referenced in the, the video. I'll just read for you from Ezekiel. The promise of salvation is about receiving this new heart, Ezekiel 11, 19, and 20 says this, I will give them an undivided heart and put a new spirit in them. I will remove from them their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. They will follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. They will be my people, and I will be their God. The idea of a heart transformation. Now, you and I know God could have done that on his own, couldn't he? Couldn't God put a new heart within us on his own? Like God is fully capable of remaking his people and making them do what he wants them to do. He could have done that, but he didn't do that, did he? He gave us the freedom to choose our response towards him, did he not? How many of you agree with that? He gave, look at your table and say, he gave us the freedom to choose, right? He gave us the freedom to choose. That's our response. Now, if you want to study that a little bit, go and read a little bit more of Galatians chapter 5. You can look at verses 13 through 25, and you can read a little bit more about what it means to participate with Christ, a life in the Spirit. And that's what God is doing in the remaking of our hearts, giving us that new heart, that new life. It's about a relationship with Him. Jesus was also clear. In John chapter 14, verse 15, you read it. If you love me, keep my commands. And his sermon, the sermon that he preached to the people on the hillside, we call it the Sermon on the Mount, he says this, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, 
but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. That is the idea that if you love me, you will keep my commands. You will keep my commands. Now, does that mean we're to go back and observe all the Old Testament commandments? No. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, love your neighbor as yourself, begins the fulfillment. If we model after Jesus Christ, we begin to fulfill all that that Old Testament law represented. But that's a journey, and that's a process. And you don't just enter into that on day one, right? Because your heart is hard, and there is this process of becoming aware of what is good and what isn't good and what things I should follow. And so that's why we take a look a little bit deeper into the Old Testament. Some of you will remember James, the book of James, the letter that James wrote. And we studied these verses, chapter 1, verses 20 through to 25, and he admonishes his hearers. He says this, be doers of the word, but not just hearers. Anybody remember that? Be doers of the word, not just hearers. He goes on in those verses to talk about the perfect law, which could be a reference to the law of Christ that Paul was referencing in Galatians. Um, most likely, it's a similar reference to the law that Jesus said. You know, the, these commandments, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. It's the greatest commandment. It's the law, the perfect law. On those two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. And you, you saw the law and the prophets broken up in the Old Testament. The perfect law of Christ is higher, but it does not necessarily exclude the Ten Commandments. Those are ways that we become aware of God's intention for humanity and, and that sort of thing. So let me close with this thought. That maybe the most compelling are John's words in his first letter, the first letter of John, and he says this, And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Jesus Christ walked the earth like you and I. He was a real human being. He walked the earth. He kept the Old Testament law. He fulfilled the Old Testament law. He did a few things slightly differently because he got to the heart of what the law was representing. And that's really what we're going to be looking at over the course of this summer is we're not going to be looking at the law like, okay, do not murder. Yes, I think we can all kind of get that idea, right? We shouldn't go around murdering anybody else. But what's the heart of the matter? What does Jesus teach about that commandment? Do not steal. Do not covet. Let's get underneath the radar. What does it mean to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? That's really what the essence of our sermon series, the series teaching series we're going to have over the course of the summer. So let me sum it up this way. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to fulfill the law. Everybody say amen. amen. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to fulfill the law. Everybody say amen. 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 There is no amount of right living or good works that will replace the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. Everybody say amen. amen. In fulfilling the law, we are no longer subject to it. Everybody say amen. amen. But we choose to live by the Spirit. Hallelujah. That's a good word. Everybody say hallelujah. hallelujah. We desire to follow Christ's pattern. There are commands that provide guidance for how we live in this life. And living a Christ-like life means doing what he did. Certainly, he lived according to the commands of his Father. But he captured the heart. He captured the heart. And that's what we want to be doing. The Ten Commandments provide a story. 
If you read the Bible from the beginning to the end, you will notice that the Ten Commandments, or the story, really, the story of Exodus, is the foundational story upon which most of the Bible is written, because it's the story of the deliverance of God's people. It is the essence of the deliverance that becomes the picture of who Christ represents in the New Testament. It is this story of deliverance of God's people throughout the world, not just his people Israel, the Jewish population. It, it's for all of us. So the story of the Exodus and where the Ten Commandments fits in right there as they're coming out of Egypt is the story of our lives as well. And it, it gives and it shapes much of who we are and how we should be living. So that's the purpose of our sermon series this summer. Um, I've got some ideas for you up here. Uh, if you could, if you would, take some time. I don't know if you all have your own personal study process. If you're in something, that's great. But uh, if you're not, maybe it is something you could be doing this week to dig in a little bit, to find some references in the New Testament to the Ten Commandments. What does Jesus say about some of the Ten Commandments? What does Paul say about some of the Ten Commandments? In general, how do we frame this discussion of the Ten Commandments? And uh, think about it in the context of as the word was spreading throughout to the, to the Gentiles, we'll say to, the, to those of us who are like us, right? The non-Jews. As that word was spreading and Peter and Paul and, the, and they came back together and they're like, this is, this is hard. Like the, the folks don't necessarily want to do the same things, right? And read Acts chapter 15 and see how did they respond? How did they respond with the law and what accommodations did they make? So that's what we're going to be looking at this summer. I wanted to take uh, a Sunday and just kind of set it up for us uh, in the future, in the next couple of weeks. We're just going to start digging in. We'll look at all of the commandments. We'll put them in context and we'll discuss them a little bit together. Amen? Amen. I'd like to invite Amy to come forward at this point. Amy's going to uh, share a little bit uh, for our offering and, and prepare us for that. And then we're going to move into a little bit more uh, time for some singing as well.